Well, this is a bittersweet morning for me, church. Uh, I just celebrated 10 years in ministry here at Hillside, which has been such a blessing. Um, thanks. Thanks for that. I kind of pictured I might have to lead the slow clap to start that. Uh, but bittersweet because this week I, I received a call, and this may be my last Sunday here. I received a call from the Canada, Canada Revenue Agency, and apparently I'm behind in my taxes. I didn't know this, and the police may come to arrest me at any moment. If they arrive this morning, please don't stop them. Um, Interesting because also earlier this week I was thinking about retiring because I got an email from, uh, I guess I'm related to a prince in Algeria, and he is, I gave him my bank account information, and he's sending $30 million to me, so I don't really need the job anymore, um, though I'd like to stay in the house if we can work that out. Um, also, Mark Zuckerberg has reached out, and I was randomly selected uh, for part of his fortune, so... Um, we'll see how it goes. It's interesting, isn't it? You can't believe everything you hear, right? You can't believe everything you see. You can't believe everything you read. You just can't believe everything that's around you. And so we live in a society where we are constantly, constantly receiving information and then deciding if we will believe it or reject it. And we do that in all sorts of areas. Just, just yesterday we were driving just by Willowbrook Mall, and the light was green, so the person went, but someone else flew through the light and smashed into them, and so we witnessed this accident. And so you always have to be processing information. Yes, the light says I can go, but what's all the information saying to me that's around us? We're just bombarded by information, and so much of it is false. Uh, fake emails like the ones I was talking about, fake phone calls. I get all sorts of calls. I think they're in Mandarin. I don't even know the scam that's happening. I can't understand what they want from me. Uh, there, there's all sorts of things that are going on, even videos that you might see. It could just be deep fake videos. Have you heard of these where they can put someone's voice, someone's face on someone else to make them say whatever message they want them to say? Let me ask you this. How many of you always trust the weather report? No, okay, they said it's going to be sunny, I'm wearing my short. No, we just, we look outside, we kind of make an educated guess. How many of you always believe the news report? No, what about the, the road report? Well, they said there's a traffic jam, I guess. No, um, you know, right now we have all sorts of uh, Prime Minister hopefuls running. How many of you have listened to a campaign and said, I think they're going to do everything they've promised to do? Any hands on? It's laughable, right? I mean, we get all this information all the time, and we're always processing, is this going to be true? Is this actually going to happen? Will this change along the way? Because so often, it does change. We live in a changing world, and that's changed the way we receive and process information. Sometimes in areas where we even have no experience. How many of you second-guess your mechanic? I know nothing about cars. I don't know. I think my tires are fine for another year. Oil change, 5,000 kilometers. I bet we can get to eight, maybe even 10,000. Right? Or how many of us second guess our doctor? Ever wanted a second opinion? I took Judah to an eye appointment. So we, he went to the eye appointment. Then we went to a specialist for a second opinion. And at that appointment, he said, okay, you don't need a third or fourth or fifth opinion, okay? This is good enough information that you're receiving. We second guess all the time, and we take it to Dr. Google, or we take it to a friend, or we phone up another mechanic. We know we're always processing and choosing what's right, what's wrong, what do we believe, what are we questioning, all those types of things. And it's because we live in a changing world. But like we talked about last week, we live in a changing world but have an unchanging God. We live in a changing world today, but we have an unchanging God who has given us his unchanging word. God's word is the same day after day after day after day. It does not change. Listen to this verse from Isaiah 40. It says this, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Considering these words of Isaiah were speaking, spoken over 2,000 years ago, I, I agree with them. It, God's word is not changing. It doesn't change, and it will endure forever. 
There was a French philosopher in the 1700s named Voltaire, and Voltaire was not very kind to Christians or to Christianity, didn't think we were the sharpest knives in the drawer. And so he said in uh, 1776, he uh, made this quote, 100 years from my day, there will not be a Bible on earth except one that is looked upon by an antiquarian curiosity seeker. There'll be no Bibles left, except maybe in some museum where you'd go just out of curiosity. Oh, that's what they used to look at. We know that Voltaire was wrong. In fact, 50 years after he died, his house was used by the Evangelical Society of Geneva to store Bibles and Christian tracts. And his printing presses that were used to print all of these different things against Christianity were used to print Bibles. I love that. The Bible won't be around. Actually, Voltaire, you're so wrong. It will supersede. It will go beyond your lifetime and much, much beyond that. Makes me think of Psalm 119 that says, All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. I believe that the Bible does not change. Here's one reason I believe that. It's because if it were going to get changed, I think it would have been changed already. Like if I, if I could go back uh, 2,000 years or 1,500 years, I might have made some changes in the Bible. Uh, think about this. In Genesis, the very first words of Genesis tell us about this all-powerful God. And whatever he says comes into being. He can create anything he wants, and so he does that. That's chapter 1. By chapter 3, the people he have created have turned away from him and have gone off on their own. By chapter 4, they've started killing people. By chapter 6, it's gotten so bad, he says, I've got to wipe them all out and start again. If I were writing the Bible, I'd say, I've got to fix this up a little bit. This doesn't sound super impressive, this powerful God, but his people scatter off almost as quickly as they can. I edit, I think, the Old Testament. I take away all the begats. I take away all the... Uh, just weird sexual relationships that ravel and unravel, all the polygamy, all the cubits. Uh, I take away all those things, just make it a little bit clearer, easier to process and understand. And that's just the Old Testament. In the New Testament, here we have God in the flesh comes to us, Jesus comes to us, and what happens? Dun, da, da, da. Nobody recognizes them. Right? I mean, nobody even seems to be looking for him. It's not the super grandest entrance. I think I'd want to make that bigger. Like, everyone gathers around. There's not just a few stinky shepherds, but everyone's there. And maybe Mary, instead of a, a manger, is actually like at the, I don't know, ward one of the hospital, and it's like all lit, made in gold. And maybe, uh, you know, later on Jesus comes along and people hate him so much they kill him. I think I would change that too. I think I'd want to just spruce that up a little bit. Everyone loves him. And if they kill him, it's because they love him so much. They're just hugging him, hugging him, hugging him, and I don't, his head pops off or something. I would change the story a little bit to make it just seem... To, and then the disciples, I'd rewrite the disciples, say they were a little bit smarter, a little bit cooler, because we want to relate to the disciples, and they're always just kind of putting their foot in their mouths and going off in the wrong direction. And I think if the Bible were to be changed, it would have been changed by now. And yet, we know that it hasn't. One of the most common attacks against Christianity and the Bible is this. It's been changed so much over time. Is that true or false? It's false, right? We've talked about this lots of times. We probably talk about it a couple times every year. But we know with 100% certainty that the Bible has not been changed over time. Why? Because we have copies that are thousands of years old that we can go back and look at and say, hold on. 2,000 years ago, Isaiah 40 said this, and now Isaiah 40 still says the same thing. So we can compare and contrast. If someone says the Bible's been changed so much over time, you can say, where did you hear that? Because it's actually proven to be false. Out of any ancient book, normally ancient books we have a few copies or a few dozen copies. For the, for the best books, we have a few hundred copies. But for the Bible, we have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of manuscripts and fragments and copies where we can look and say, hold on, we can compare all these things and say, hold on, God's word has not changed. This is the unchanging word from an unchanging God preserved and recorded for us. Makes me think of Jesus in Matthew 5 says this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. 
For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Not a single word, Jesus says, will pass away from the Bible, from God's word, because God's word is unchanging. Now, you might say, well, that's fine. It hasn't changed. But here's a pretty significant question. Is it true? Because who cares if we preserved a book that's full of just lies and half-truths and fake news and all those sorts of other things? Who cares? That's not helpful for anyone at all. It's unchanging, but is it true? We know that the Bible has been questioned and examined and debated more than any other book by far. I mean, no other book has ever gone through the trials and tribulations that the Bible has. And yet what we see again and again is that the Bible proves itself to be true again and again and again. It's proven itself to be historically true. For example, uh, for decades they were saying there's no guy named Pontius Pilate. There was never a guy named Pontius Pilate, which means he couldn't have tried Jesus and Jesus wouldn't have been crucified. They made all that up. And then they started finding things with Pontius Pilate's name on it. Uh, for example, they found uh, the Pontius Pilate stone, it's called, which has his name and his title. Say, oh, hold, well, hold on, maybe, they're, maybe the Bible is true about Pontius Pilate. And then they found uh, coins uh, that he had minted. And then they found other things about him. And then they found the, uh, the words of this uh, historian named Philo. He wrote this. See if this sounds like Pontius Pilate to you. A man of very inflexible disposition and very merciless as well as very obstinate. In Philo's opinion, Pilate was exceedingly angry and at all times a man of most ferocious passions who had a habit of insulting others cruelly and murdering people untried and uncondemned. Does that sound like the guy we read about in the Bible? Absolutely historically the Bible has been proven true and true again and again and again. Same with uh, geographers have gone out and said, well, hold on, let's take a look. The Bible says there's this town here. There's never been a town there. And then they start excavating and say, oh, hold on. There is, there is a town here, actually. The Bible proves itself to be true again and again and again. Here's even a better test for me, though. Better than history and better than geography, it's this. Was Jesus trustworthy what do you think is jesus trustworthy yeah I, I believe so that's why i'm a christian i believe that i can trust jesus here's what we see jesus do with the old testament he quotes it again and again and again sometimes you'll say it is written and you'll find that again and again in the gospels it is written it is written it is written what's he referring to it's not oprah's newest book or the greatest uh, tabloid times He's repeating the Bible, the Old Testament, again and again and again. Other times he just hops right into it, or he says, you have heard it said, or he quotes from all sorts of different books and places and times in the Old Testament saying, this is true. I authenticate this. I trust this. This is a trustworthy word for you to follow. In John 17, Jesus says this, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Did Jesus think the Bible was true? Absolutely. He thought it was the truth, the standard, the measurement for everything else to be written. And not just parts of it, not just this verse or that verse, but the whole thing in its entirety. Jesus thought this was all true, all from God. In 1804, there was a man who sat at his desk with, I don't know, a knife or something like that and two Bibles, and he started cutting out what he thought was true, and saving that on a piece of paper, and then discarding what he decided wasn't true. And the reason that is remembered, or why that's significant, is because it wasn't just any desk he was at. He was at the White House, and it was a president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. And he set out to correct, to fix the Bible. These things are true and worth keeping. These things can be discarded. Just by a quick show of hands, how many of you would uh, select a prime minister or a president to select what's true in the Bible? Anyone here, would you be like, oh, I really think that would be the person to do it? No, 
We don't have to do that. The Bible's not a, a buffet. The Bible isn't a menu where you take a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but I won't have any of that. The Bible is true in its entirety, and we can trust all of it. Proverbs 30 says this, Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. Do not add to His words, or He will rebuke you and prove you a liar. That last verse is actually pretty important. Uh, don't add to it, or, or you'll turn out to be the liar. You'll be found to be the one who's false. God didn't miss anything. God didn't err in any way where he needs you to top up or fix up what he wrote. It means that the Bible is true all on its own. It's true about who it tells us God is and his character. It's true as it talks about us and the problem, the reality of sin that each one of us faces. It's true as it tells us about the one and only Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, who lived and died and rose again for us. I like that warning that it has. You will be proven a liar. And it makes me think of in our world, there's, there's crazy warnings. Have you seen these on products? Sometimes you'll be reading, oh, how can I use this product? And then it'll have, here's a few that stood out to me. On a hair dryer, there's this warning for this hair dryer. Warning, do not use while sleeping. Could you imagine that? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, there was one on, uh, I think it might have been NyQuil. It was a, a sleeping product. It said, warning may cause drowsiness. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> That's why I'm taking it. There's all these crazy warnings. Here's another one on pepper spray. May cause irritation to the eyes. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's why I bought it. Uh, I saw one on a box of fishing hooks. Warning, harmful if swallowed. <laughs> yes, thank you. But this is one of my favorite ones, and I have a picture of this one. Uh, caution, hot. Avoid pouring on crotch area. <laughs> Ne pourrez pas dans the area du ulala. Nine drop in the hot coffee dans the knackers. <laughs> I love that. I, I believe that is a false warning label, but it's so good. Just to remind us, all of these crazy warnings are out there. All sorts of warnings. And sometimes we need the warning, but sometimes it's like, come on, is this really needing to even be told to us? Do we even need the warning label? I shared one warning label with you from the Bible before, but it actually comes with an even stronger one. Some of the very last words, right before the end of the Bible, right before the end of Revelation chapter 22, it says this. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this scroll. I mean, that's a big warning, isn't it? That's a powerful, powerful warning. Listen, do not add to this and do not take away from this. Don't touch. God has ordained this book. It's the book sent from heaven for us is a song that we sing with our school and Sunday school often. Don't add or take away, otherwise you'll miss your chance to eat from the tree of life in the kingdom of heaven with God himself. And yet it's still such a temptation. It's such a temptation for us as Christians to want to pick and choose. Oh, I believe this, but not that. Or it's okay if, you know, you, I do this sin or that sin. God, you know, God's mind has changed about that, but this is the unchanging word. God doesn't change his mind on things like sin or forgiveness or uh, us or Jesus. God doesn't change his mind. Oh, it's okay if those people want to do that thing. It's not okay. You're adding or taking away from the Bible. It's such a temptation, and yet we have such a strong word warning not to do it. Church, we live in a changing world, but we have an unchanging God, and he has given us his unchanging word. It's good news, and it's true. It's good news because God's promise to you will never change. Forever who believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus, I'm ready to believe in you. Oh, I'm sorry. That's, you're too late for that now. 
that offer is closed. You'll have to wait for some other opportunity. God never does that. Confess your sins and he will be faithful to forgive them. That's the, a promise in the Bible. God, I confess. Sorry, I don't feel like forgiving you today. Could you imagine if God's words changed like that? And yet they're the same day after day. And so you can trust the one who's made the promise. You can trust our unchanging God because his word to you will not change. Hebrews 4 says this, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I like that verse as it reminds us that God's word is living and active. It's doing something. I don't have to change God's word. God's word has come to change me. I don't need to pick and choose. God is doing his work inside of me, driving out sin, replacing it with faithfulness, driving out doubt and fear, replacing it with trust and comfort and hope and love in our unchanging God. I read a quote this week, and I couldn't find who the author was, but it says this, The Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs after me. It has hands. It lays hold of me. My hope and my prayer for you, church, is that you would know this unchanging God and his unchanging word, that you'd know it was true, and that its job is to change you, and your job is to trust it and believe it. And put your faith in the one that it points to, Jesus Christ himself, the God who came in the flesh to rescue sinners just like you and me and the world around us. The Bible is active and it speaks, that it has feet and it pursues, that it has hands and it grasps. I want to close just by reading part of Psalm 19 as it talks about how good God's unchanging word is. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's pray. O oh, unchanging God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, we give you thanks that your word is also unchanging. Lord, that the words you spoke to bring everything into creation have been recorded for us. And we can trust those words until the end of time and even beyond it, knowing that you, O oh God, are unchanging, faithful forever to your word, faithful to your promises, faithful to your people, faithful even when we are faithless, God, that you do not change. Lord, we ask that through your Holy Spirit you would convict us of all those places, areas in our lives where we've picked and chosen from your word what we would believe. Lord, we pray that you'd correct us, rebuke us, turn us around so that we trust you properly and stop trying to make your word accommodate or fit our lives or our opinions. Instead, Lord, through your living and active word, shape us change us, transform us, correct us so that we may delight in your will and in your word more and more and more. And Lord, we're so prone to be caught up with other things, other things that fade away, 
Other things that don't last beyond the day. Other things that are here but then fail and fall. We can become so preoccupied by those things. So Lord, we ask that you would occupy our hearts and minds, our lives with your word, with the privilege of being your children, and with the mission of spreading your word and the hope of Jesus, crucified and risen for us. Lord, as we prepare this week to continue in an election campaign, Lord, we pray for truth. We pray for your word to reign victorious. We pray for whoever, whatever leaders are elected, Lord, we pray that you would convict them by your spirit and make them faithful followers of you. Lord, we pray as schools prepare to open, we pray that there would be uh, an energy and an excitement about that. And we pray for all the students and staff who are returning to school, that there would just be a hedge of protection around them, that they'd be able to head to school trusting that it's a good place for them to be and a safe place for them to be. Lord, we pray for all those who are struggling with health for any reason. We ask that you'd bring them to a complete and full recovery. We pray and give you thanks for doctors and nurses and medics. Lord, we pray for each one of us that you would lead, guide, and direct us by your word and that you would bless us in the stations you've called us to, whether that's to singleness or marriage, whether that's to employed or retired, whether that's whatever it might be, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness to us, the blessings you've poured out to us in Jesus. Help us to trust in him more and more, even as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us.